Welcome, everyone, and welcome to what is actually very dark and rainy London. We're very excited to have you here uh, as part of the UK hub for the economy of Francesco. This is a talk about saving Eden, consumer choice, poverty, and our forests. But let's face it, this is a Friday night. So as every what we do on Friday nights in the UK is to go to a pub. So what we're going to do, uh, and just to very much welcome you to the UK, to give you a sense of culture of what it's like to be in the UK, we are giving you two very amazing things that are famous for the UK, which is a variety show and pub quiz. So the variety show, it's all kinds of ways in which we like to show our talent. So you know Britain's Got Talent, X Factor, all those things, you know, that comes from the UK. So we're going to give you something of that. But we're also going to give you the pub quiz. And that way, what it, it's all about is just um, some of the most famous quiz shows that are also in the UK are going to be here. And so we're going to try a little uh, uh, for you audience interaction and in getting your mind going. So the first step to participating is that you have your drink ready. So I have here um, my glass of white wine and I have my wonderful co-hosts here, uh, Bokani and C and Tamaris. What are you guys drinking over there? I have a Merlot. Lovely. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> and I'm here with some beer. <laughs> I'm That's here with a wine from Tylee. Ah, that's wonderful. So the idea is you're not chugging this, you're savoring it. And you're savoring it with each answer you have. So what we'll, uh, I'll present a question as part of the pub quiz. And what we'll do is you'll write down your answers in the YouTube channel, in which case, um, my dear lovely co-hosts will actually say what you're saying, and we'll figure out if you have the right answer. So step three is you actually figure out how many answers you've gotten right. And at the end of the quiz, you do the very typical thing that we do in UK quizzes, which is you throw it away because all points don't really matter. So I hope you get a sense of uh, British fun. We're going to start the next segment with the variety show. So we have a wonderful um, artist. He, uh, he did not do this for Economy of Francesco, but I think he really sets the scene. It's Prince EA, and he's talking about human impacts in a very short period of time in spoken word. So for Prince EA. Fun fact, planet Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Mankind, about 140,000 years old. Let me put that in perspective. If you condense the Earth's lifespan into 24 hours, that's one full day, then we have been here on this planet for, drum roll please, three seconds. Three seconds. And look what we've done. We have modestly named ourselves Homo sapiens, meaning wise man. But is man really so wise? Smart, yes, and it's good to be smart, but not too smart for your own good. Yes, we have split the atom. Yes, we build clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes. But at the same time, those atoms we split created nuclear warfare. And our quest to explore the galaxy rejects and neglects the home that we have here now. So no, that cannot be wisdom. Wisdom is different. While intelligence speaks, wisdom listens. And we willingly covered our ears to Mother Nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help-wanted signs. Wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if we were wise, we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before or more drought, hurricanes, and wildfire than ever before because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we have increased the extinction of animals by 1,000 times the normal rate. What a feat. In the next 10 to 100 years, every beloved animal character in every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lions it's gone, rhino's gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear, gone. In three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us will be gone because of us. In this three seconds. 
In an existence shorter than a Vine video, we turn the circle of life into our own personal conveyor belt. Somebody, anybody help. We were given so much. The only planet in this solar system with life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, we are one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. And I don't want to get too spiritual, but how are we not a miracle? We are perfectly positioned to the sun so we don't burn, but not too distant so we don't turn to ice. Goldilocks said it best. We are just right. This paradise where we are given medicine from trees, not coincidentally, but because like the song says, we are family. Literally, everything, every species is connected genetically from the sunflower to the sunfish. And this is what we must recognize before it's too late because the real crisis is not global warming, environmental destruction, or animal agriculture. It is us. These problems are symptoms of us, byproducts of us, our inner reflection. Loss of connection has created this misdirection. We have forgotten that everything contributes to the perfection of Mother Nature. Corporations keep us unaware and disconnected, but they have underestimated our strength. Contrary to popular belief, millions are waking up out of their sleep, seeing our home being taken right up under our feet. We cannot allow our history to be written by the wicked, greedy, and loony. It is our duty to protect Mother Nature from those who refuse to see her beauty. Call me crazy, but I believe we should have the right to eat food that's safe with ingredients we can pronounce. Drink water that is clean. Marvel at trees. Breathe air free of toxins. These are natural rights, not things that can be bargained for in Congress. See, they want you to feel powerless, but it has been said that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing can cause a typhoon halfway around the world. But when enough people come together, we too will make waves and watch the world into a new era filled with love and connection, freedom for all without oppression. But it is up to you, yes, you watching this behind this screen to make the effort because time is of the essence and only together can we make it to the fourth second. So keeping that in mind, we're trying to get four seconds. We've made such a big impact on the earth in the past three seconds of what would be, um, if you were to put that into, as Prince EA said, 24 hours of the earth's time, we would only have that impact in three seconds. But in three seconds, the scientific community has acknowledged that unlike other epochs where you've had geological periods like the Jurassic era, era or the ice era, um, we have as indelible mark on the earth, and it's called the age of the Anthropocene. This is something that the scientific community is proposing, that because humans have had such a huge impact, um, and they're just trying to figure out what is the most appropriate date to figure that out. And there is actually a date that most people have agreed on. There's still some consent, trying to find some consensus. So this is not official. But here is the first pub quiz question. It is, you may recognize the format. So it's a very famous show that's seen around the world. I know there's many syndications. So we are going to play, who wants to become a saint? So that's right, we have St. Francis there. What you win is basically becoming a saint and a lot of blessings. So which is the date that the scientific community has the most consensus on as marking the start of the age of the Anthropocene? Is it A? the agricultural revolution, which happened 12, 12 to 15,000 years ago, B, the industrial revolution, which happened in 1850, C, the great acceleration and the atomic age, which was 1950, or D, the age of the internet in 1983. So I'll give you 30 seconds to be able to figure that out. And I'm gonna rely on my wonderful co-hosts to actually tell me what uh, is being said on the YouTube channel. Don't be shy, guys. Like, go ahead and throw it out. It'd be lovely to see, um, well, how up you are on your geological eras. Ooh, we're looking on the chat. I've got five votes for bees at the moment. A lot of votes. Ooh, six for bee. All right. So the Industrial Revolution, when coal became a thing. Juliana is going against the grain, though. So well done, you. Um, let's see. I got this wrong, by the way. I think it should be known. I was never invited onto any pub quiz teams for <laughs> We've got one book for C now, actually, from uh, Nicolas. All right. And hi, and hi from Argentina. This is fun. This is so great to see. Well, that's wonderful. So I'm going to say we're hitting that 30 second mark. I may give five more seconds. Five, 
four, three, two, one. So Nicholas, you are the person who wins here. It's the great acceleration in the atomic age. Believe it or not, most of the scientific consensus is around 1950. My father was born in 1950. That means in two generations time, I know there's generations after me, but in two generations time, we have made such a mark on the earth that we get our own geological era. Congratulations, humans. All right, the next question is uh, one that goes into what we're talking about, which is saving Eden and focusing on forests. How, and I cannot think of something that can really show humans mark on the earth than looking at forests. It's more visible than the climate. So how much of global primary forest have we lost since 1990? And this is a statistics that comes from the latest report. I won't tell you in case you guys are going to look it up, but it's the Food and Agricultural Organization's 2020 report. So is it, uh, since 1990, we've lost 100,000 square kilometers, which is about the size of Iceland. Is it the size of Germany? So about 350,000 kilometers. Or could it be Kenya, 600,000 square kilometers, or the biggest, which is Mozambique at 800,000 kilometers. So I'm gonna give you 30 seconds again, um, and let's hear it from our co-hosts. Where do people think uh, we're getting at? You've changed these up a little. So mm -hmm. last time I got it wrong and I'll just get it wrong again, but- I want to let you get a head start, Bokani. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna go with Kenya this time. All right, Kenya. All right, anything being said on the YouTube channel? Not yet. I think people are being a bit shy. Oh, oh they're getting okay. through. He's coming through. <laughs> yeah. People are selecting the letter C. C. Or oh, a D. Barbara's going against the green with a D, and Maria as well with a D. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. No one's going for Iceland. We don't think oh, we're doing hi, very Barbara. well. All right. Well, I'm going to move it on. So five, four, three, two, one. Barbara and Maria, you got it right. It is Mozambique. It's about 800,000 square kilometers since 1990 we've lost. Now that's a sobering thought, but it's kind of good to get some perspective here. So there has been actually a global forest expansion and contraction. We have seen that actually global deforestation rates have reduced um, between the five eras between 1990 and 2020. So that's a good thing. So a little more scarier is, is that maybe that's because there's less forest to reduce. I'm not quite sure here, but what is sadder is, is that the forest expansion hasn't increased as much. We haven't even uh, reached 1990, 2000 levels. So that's something to think about when we're thinking about how do we actually save Eden. So what I'd like to then think about is actually we're losing our forests or we're, we're still losing our forests. So, and what's interesting is, is that since 1990, about 40% of forests are lost because of agricultural commodities. And then there's other types of commodities that we cut down forests. Now, when I think about that, it, you'd be surprised actually what some of them are. I'm sure there's been a lot of statistics that you would know, but this is family feud. So if you haven't recognized family feud and my attempt at creating that again, um, what we'd want is there are four options here. I want you to list which are the four commodities, which are the largest drivers of deforestation and forest change and which ranking order you would think. And I want something a bit more specific than food. So what type of food? And you can be as uh, creative as you want to be, but go ahead. I have a feeling most of you will get it. It's just one commodity that you may not realize. So go ahead, I'm opening up for 30 seconds. Can I make the hipster guess, which is sure. avocados? <laughs> yeah, that smashed avocado toast is really- <laughs> really problematic, it is very problematic. I know, it could be quinoa as well. You know, like- Oh little, yes, of course. Realizing it's a superfood, they're just saying like, you know what, quinoa, that's the one we're going, to, suddenly we're losing our forests on. You know, this is one of the reasons I like that video where he says we have to have food we can pronounce. And I was like, well, <laughs> you are so right. Oh, interesting. People yeah, are people. answering here. Palm right. oil. Yeah. Right? yeah, and red meat and soy. Soy, yeah. Ooh, Anna's going for it. Number one, cattle. Number two, soy. And number three, palm. 
all of them, Anna. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, you know something? I'm just going to move. Anna, you get so many blessings from Francis. I hope he makes you a saint like, like that because you are not wrong. So, oil, but interestingly, oil palm the fourth. So, about uh, 270,000 acres, hectares, sorry. Then let's not forget traditional forestry, timber, and pulp. So 380,000 hectares. Kind of surprised that didn't come up, but I'm sure it, just, it was just more so obvious. Um, then yes, soy, 480,000 hectares. But the thing that's really scary is what you've all, one thing just by the way to, to say about soy, I always say, I always show the statistic and inevitably someone says, oh, look at all those vegetarians. Here's something that'd be very interesting and just quickly to note, 80% of soy actually goes to animal feed. So for your chicken, for your pork, for your beef, it goes to animal feed. It doesn't go to vegetarians. It doesn't go to tofu. So my point here is, is, is that when we think of meat, we have to think about not just about the actual meat, but the feed of it. I didn't realize how much forest we're losing and more so than timber and pulp, more so than oil and palm, it's to soy, <laughs> like what? Um, but yeah, beef, beef as a single thing um, is more than all these those other combined. And that's a bit of a sobering thought. Um, one thing, uh, I, inevitably, when you talk about this, uh, I'm just going to make one quick point here. Um, most people either go two ways. They either go full vegetarian, uh, which is great to have a movement that thinks about what they eat, but then also a whole bunch of people who um, feel as if it's their right uh, to eat beef. And I'm not going to get into that fray. What I'm going to say is something to think about is, is that, you know, it, we're in the UK, so the Sunday roast, the Sunday roast was the special family meal where you would share a really good piece of beef. And the question is now we take it for granted, we can get beef for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And there are many reasons for that. There's a lot of farm subsidies for that. There's so many things going on that allow for beef to be it. My question would be, what are the things, and this is just for you to consider, what are the things you can do um, in thinking about those statistics? You're a consumer, how would you change um, how you eat as a way of reducing environmental impact, but also enjoying a good meal of when beef becomes uh, a special occasion. Um, I, just because of time, I'm going to move it to the next one. Um, but I just also wanted to say, like, the thing is, commodity-driven deforestation is different in different places. So in Latin America, it is primarily beef and soy, but in Southeast Asia, it is palm oil. That is more of the predominant one. And in Africa, it actually is subsistence farming. So and that is a poverty driver. As more and more area, land, air, land areas become hard to farm, they move to other areas and they deforest it. So you cannot not think about that. Um, so the next question game we're going to play is called, uh, it's in Have I Got News For You? So if this is the answer, what is the question? And we're going to quickly move along. So the answer is 80, 880 million. And in typical, uh, who wants to be a saint style? So the first one is, what is eight? What is eight eighty million actually the answer to? Where does it fit in these question in these statements? Is it eight eighty million people spend part of their time collecting fuel wood or producing charcoal? Could it be eight eighty million animal species that live in forests? Could it be eight eighty million tree species are in the world, or is it eight eighty million vegetarians in the world? So um, I don't know if you guys want to give a guess out here. Um, have I Got News For You is one of my all time favorite shows. And every time I'm watching on TV, I'm like, how can they possibly get it wrong? Um, <laughs> well, you, like, you read a lot of newspapers, Bakani. because I do not, <laughs> I do not. I spend way too much time on social media. But luckily we have other people who may. So Gabrielle has B. A C A D. Everyone's going for something different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could Ariel be from Brazil selecting A. Oh, really? Oh, All right. Oh, you you influenced the decision. Now. There's lots of A's coming through now. <laughs> well, you know something. Let's that's called great collective decision making. It is A. So if you got it right, it is eight eighty million spend part of their time collecting fuel wood or producing charcoal. And just to kind of really bring this uh, idea home, it is 
90% of people living in extreme poverty, of that 90%, 90% of people do this. Like it is part of their livelihood. They have to live and they require it. So 880 million is the final number on that, which is, again, if you think about it, it's almost a seventh, one in seven people in the world have to do that. So the next one is 86 million people. So, eight, sorry, not 86 million people, but 86 million. So what is that an answer to? Is it 86 million hectares have been planted? Is it the amount of money Jeff Bezos in B, which is the amount of money Jeff Bezos has spent to save the forests or pledged to spend to save on the forests? Is it C, 86 million bee colonies that are to be preserved in the forest? And then a D, 86 million green jobs and livelihoods are supported by forests. So which one do you guys think it is? I don't know how they would count the bee colonies. That's my oh, first. Oh, you'd be amazed. Artificial intelligence. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Uh, but then I don't know how some sort of would have to have a satellite that would allow you to do that. <laughs> I mean, it could be on the ground data. data. I hope be Bezos has spent more money than that because yeah. 86 million compared to his a billion a day that he's making over COVID crisis. Mm, indeed. <laughs> Like, you go tell him, on, you go tell him. You're not even married anymore. You got better things to spend money on? Let's do this. <laughs> All right. So anyone, any answers coming in? We are they getting are. lots of Ds coming in uh, with uh, a C and an A as well in the chat. All right. Well, you know something for those who said D, it is actually the million, that's the amount of people who actually are uh, required are reliant on li their livelihoods in the world based on forests, which actually goes into this very important point. You cannot stop deforestation without solving po poverty. And I happened to be in a meeting with a lot of Brazilian um, policymakers and also with that point that came home, that if you cannot give them an alternative livelihood, the things that they have to do something, if someone's going to pay them to cut down the forest in order, or if they're trying to preserve the forest and other people are coming into their territory and cutting it down, how do you make sure that you keep it up? And so the key thing about addressing deforestation is actually addressing poverty. It is so together on that. And what I want to present is something that my company that we work with, we work with communities around the world. What we do is, um, and especially with forestry projects, I've become such a passionate advocate of figuring out ways in which you can finance forestry protection because it's very difficult. And forestry protection that actually works with people and works with communities because they really, you, you, it, I, I'm going to tell you now, what, the number one reason forestry projects don't work is when you don't work with communities. And so this is a project uh, called the Kariba project. It's uh, actually one of my favorites that my company does. It is, it uses carbon credits. So the idea with this project is is that it pays people to actually keep the forest up. And if the forest is proven to be up, that's when you get paid for the amount of carbon that is avoided uh, to be released. So it's a way of using carbon financing, the sale of credits to finance real activities that go to communities. And this project is uh, one of my favorites. It's in Zimbabwe. It covers four national parks. It is um, also eight safari parks. <laughs> and what it does is, is that it was started in 2011. It was a community-led project that actually worked with communities who live in these forests, who work in these forests, who depend on these forests. Um, and it's very hard to stop illegal poaching or illegal uh, logging um, and also illegal um, wildlife um, yeah, poaching. Um, and so it is a forest protection project. The way we ensure that um, there actually is forest protection is by working with the communities, working out with a game plan. We also provide, so the sale of the carbon credits does go, the revenues go to the communities. Uh, that revenue has been used for community projects, everything from teaching people how to do sustainable farming techniques, uh, to drilling boreholes, to actually beekeeping, some of our favorite, one of our favorite guys there is a beekeeper. Um, and he makes sure that those ecosystems are upheld and also from illegal logging um, that actually destroys those ecosystems. There's been 14 health clinics, 43 schools. It's been an amazing intervention. 
and it's incredibly important. Now, this actually protect. We also work with all types of people, not just the communities, but like the forest rangers who have to take care of the safaris, and so they ensure that the elephants stay there, the hippos stay there, the short ground hornbill is there. So these ecosystems keeping it up, and there's many projects around the world. Um, one thing I'll say is I'm really proud of that, the work that we do for that. We work with indigenous communities in Australia. We work with them as a way of ensuring that we use their traditional techniques to ensure controlled fire testing. So there's a lot we can learn and it's these kinds of financing that can help. Now that giving you my impassioned uh, way in which we <laughs> use finance in a good way. I'm Maria, going to you didn't choose that because I'm from Zimbabwe and went to Kariba when I was five years old and I actually saw the hippos as part oh. of a school trip. Everyone has a year at a school trip at the end of primary school. Um, and that was one of the areas we visited. So I am I, so thrilled. <laughs> I, 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 I did not put two and two together, but hey, we're uh, taking care of it. I'll go. take you there. Zimbabwe, yeah. Yes, um, <laughs> that has a special place in my heart too. So oh, so I'm so, well, that's wonderful. Now, just because of time, we're going to go to our last thing. It is a... Um, climate change poem I wrote to the future generation, but actually I found most future generations may not get the jokes here. It is a form of satire, another very famous uh, medium in the UK, and this is the Rockaboo Family Adventures, a whimsical satire on life in the 22nd century, written by me. So, on the distant isle of Antarctica, far, far away, the Rockaboo family contemplated about going on a holiday. Oh, Mr. Rockaboo, I need a vacation. Work and no play does not keep the blues at bay. Oh, well, Mrs. Rockaboo, a vacation, you say? A vacation in which nation to go on a holiday? I want to relax. I need to relax. Sipping some wine would seem mighty fine. Wine, you say? Well, I know the perfect place. The vineyards of Wales produced some fine Beaujolais. Wales has that perfect climate to grow those juicy grapes. It has that Mediterranean weather, so even the sheep don't wear their sweaters. Ah, oh, Mr. Rockaby, you are completely right. Bordeaux and Tuscany were so 21st century. Their soils are dry, for rain they cry. The poor farmers there can grow nothing nowhere. But what about you, Mr. Rockaboo? Where would you like to go? Sitting around drinking wine is not you, I know. Well, Mrs. Rockaboo, I would like an adventure. An underwater sea excursion is my holiday version. Ah, well, there are some lovely cities where you can go on diving expeditions. New Orleans, Venice, and Dakar are all the underwater meccas. What a brilliant idea, but how do we get there? There are no more flights since the last climate strike. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Rockaboo. The ice has fully gone. We can sail across Antarctica under the winter's sun. We'll take a cruise ship to anywhere we want to go. You can drink your fine wine and I'll dive in the seas below. It's so wonderful living in Antarctica in this 22nd century. For those near the equator, well, we sure do feel sorry. But those are the breaks when it comes to climate change. Some win and many, many, many lose. Why do you find it so strange? So as funny as that could be, it's also a bit painful. So let's work hard to making that not the end. Um, thank you very much. It's been such a wonderful pleasure to host you in the UK. And now we're going to go towards our Brazilian uh, commentators. So um, what we just want to, as passing on the baton, one thing to think about is just when we think of deforestation, we don't often think of Western Europe, where a lot of deforestation happened years and years ago. Honestly, like there's so few UK forests, it's only 13% of the land that is covered by woodlands now, even though the whole island was covered a lot by trees. 
And so we need to think about what that solution might look like. The UK government has set itself a target of establishing 30,000 hectares of new woodland in England by 2025. This isn't good enough. If woodlands cover in the UK was double to 26% through rewilding programs, we can help address greenhouse emissions globally and support wildlife locally too. We in the global north need to acknowledge, uh, we need to acknowledge and recognize the impact of our lifestyles and patterns of consumption on others, both on less well off communities within our societies, but also on people in the global south. So we'd love to be uh, welcoming our uh, Brazilian guests as well to share in uh, a pint or uh, a drink of your choice, really, so that we can also hand our baton over. So uh, if we actually, um, what we can do is if we put uh, the presentation off, then uh, I believe um, I've got Tamiris on here where we can hand the baton over as well to demonstrate that transfer. Yes, uh, do you want to make the transition now? Yeah, yes. absolutely. So this is a, a London 2012 baton handing over to uh, Brazil. Football invented in the UK, but actually perfected in Brazil. Brazil. <laughs> I love so this. Let's I just love end this. with a cheers, actually. Yeah, cheers. we've got. Uh, yeah, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Lovely to share this moment with you. We are very happy to be here. And actually, as you said, uh, the British invented the football, but it's perfect for the Brazil. The, us Brazilian, we love football and we love uh, the UK as well. We love the wine and beer. And thank you very much for this. Brazil will be with uh, you in a few minutes. And okay. thank you so much from all of the UK for joining and listening in. And taking part in the quiz. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.